Hey everybody, thanks so much for coming to my short video presentation for the 2022 ETE conference. My name is Lisa Gabbert and I am uh, looking forward to talking with you a little bit in this presentation about some of the ways I've been rethinking assignments in the post-COVID era. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. I have a short PowerPoint. Hopefully uh, this will work. Okay, there it is. Uh, the title of my presentation is Deadlines, Test, and Sundry Assignments, Rethinking Conventional Frameworks in the Post-COVID Era. Um, again, my name is Dr. Lisa Gabbert, and I'm Associate Professor of Folklore Studies in the Department of English here at Utah State University. Um, and I thought this would be a good topic to tie to the conference theme, which is teaching reimagined, because I really have been working hard over the past couple of years, a little bit be before COVID, but uh, certainly during COVID, to rethink some of um, the sort of default teaching strategies and teaching presumptions um, that I've had uh, most of my life. And a lot of these have to do with uh, deadlines and time limits for test and the way I organize and structure my semester in terms of uh, grading. So I just wanted to uh, talk with you about what I've been doing. Uh, so what I'm gonna do in this presentation is I'm going to uh, kind of give an overview of, of what I have been doing uh, and the results, uh, share a few student responses with you, and then also uh, kind of talk through my own questions and my own evaluation. And of course, at the end, I would love it if you had any comments or questions or suggestions, uh, because this is uh, very much an ongoing learning process uh, for me. Uh, so how I got started on this path was that I really noticed that students were struggling to turn assignments in. Um, oftentimes when they uh, did an assignment, it wasn't necessarily uh, very good, uh, or at least uh, in the way that I wanted them to do it. Um, they also had struggled quite a bit completing the tests. Uh, they weren't doing the reading. And so I really felt students weren't um, engaged in a lot of ways uh, in the class. And I felt this pre-COVID as well, but I certainly, during COVID, it went, you know, I felt that really went uh, way up. And so I started experimenting with uh, ways to um, kind of get them a little bit more engaged. And these were some experimentations that I did before I went to a very flexible deadline schedule. Uh, one of the things I did was that I had a number of assignments, uh, but a lot of them weren't graded. And I thought, well, okay, uh, let's move to some low stakes assignments. Um, let me see if, you know, if I don't grade them, then, you know, it'll take the stress off and, and some of the anxiety. Um, but that really, in my experience, did not work very well. It really uh, led to uh, students getting the idea that an ungraded assignment was not important, that they really didn't need to do it, and, and sort of some student uh, apathy. And also some complaints uh, in the course evaluations about, you um, having to do ungraded work. So, so clearly in the student's mind, there's a, a correlation between earning points for something and the, uh, the relevance or importance of the assignment. So that was a, a strategy that really uh, did not work. Um, but when I did grade uh, the assignments, um, oftentimes if they were late, uh, which they increasingly uh, came to be, the, the points I deducted for lateness were really impacting students' grade and didn't and that didn't really reflect how I felt uh, the student had performed holistically over the course uh, of the semester. So I began having some pretty in-depth conversations with some of my students about, about what was going on. And uh, like all of you um, uh, know, uh, and I'm sure I have discovered, you know, I found uh, not only were my students really, really struggling, but they were struggling with really, really hard uh, things. You know, I can recall, for example, a mom who is in one of my classes, she was working full time and she had four kids for, you know, just one example. Um, another had, you know, a family member uh, attempt suicide. And of course there, you know, are, were significant mental health issues with many of these students uh, as instructors were very aware of the mental health um, uh, problems that have been increasing or at least being more documented over the past couple of years, particularly uh, in the COVID era. Um, 
And at the same time, I also, in my own personal life, I have a, or had a, a high school student who was also really struggling with uh, some of the similar issues, especially mm. in the areas of mental health. So um, my own, I would say my own attitude really kind of changed as uh, a result of these in-depth conversations with my students. I really, you know, came to understand that they uh, were not slacking off, they weren't making things up, but they really, really uh, had uh, some significant challenges. And I started thinking about my own educational background, which is a fairly, you know, traditional elite academic background. You know, I went to very nice schools. I had the support of my parents. I was not a first generation college student. And I came to the conclusion that really, um, you know, my students, uh, my own experience did not reflect as, as a college student and later as a grad student, these kinds of challenges. Or if people did have these kinds of challenges, they really weren't um, acknowledged. So in a way, my own academic privilege uh, and academic background, you know, was sort of driving some of my expectations in terms of the way that students should accomplish uh, their work. And so I decided to try and change it. Uh, now, I originally just made uh, exceptions for students who were really struggling, you know, these students that I had these pretty in-depth conversations with. But um, over time, I decided just to kind of implement um, some flexibility as a policy and, and see what happened. Um, so what I did was I, uh, I um, essentially got rid of most of the hard uh, deadlines and got rid of the time limits for tests. So for example, exams. Um, they were taken online, uh, they were at home, they were open book and open notes. Um, and because uh, I was giving it through Canvas, they basically had a week to take the exam. So for example, the exam would open on a Monday, maybe close on a Sunday, but really within that time frame, there was no time limit. So it wasn't like the exam closed after two hours or something like that. There was a final deadline when the exam had to be uh, done, but once they logged into the exam and opened it, they could take as long as they want and they could use really uh, any resource they want. Um, now I will say that my exams tend to be a combination of uh, multiple choice, uh, a number of short essay questions and a long essay question. And um, some of the information can be found sort of superficially online, but really the answers are pretty specific to my classes. We read very specific texts that are probably not replicated uh, elsewhere. Um, they're based in class discussions. And so they're pretty specific to that course. So I'm really not worried um, about cheating uh, in the conventional sense. You know, if they can go find uh, the answer in one of the uh, books that we've read, great. You know, I'm, I'm all for it. It means that they know where to find the answer in the book. They're willing to go search for it and, and answer the question uh, for, for the exam. Um, so other assignments uh, that aren't tests, you know, discussion posts, uh, for example, or um, homework assignments. I have deadlines. But uh, I also tell them that they really can turn it in at any time uh, during the semester and earn at least some of the points. They may not learn all of the points that the uh, assignment is worth, but they can certainly earn uh, some of them. And they can turn those in all the way up till uh, the last day of class. Um, and then the final papers, this is a little bit trickier. A lot of my classes, I have them write a research paper. Um, and those are uh, scaffolded. So in other words, they have to write a proposal, they have to write a, um, uh, find sources and turn the sources in, they have to write a rough draft, they have to write a final draft. So there's a number of steps that they do. And each of those steps have deadlines. Uh, but again, if they miss that deadline, I tell them turn it in when you can. Uh, the penalty for turning it in late is that they do not necessarily get the kind of feedback at each step that they normally would give. I often work, for example, with writing fellows, um, and I did not feel like it was fair to the writing fellows um, to work with students who had turned things in beyond the deadline. So I might give a little bit of feedback, uh, but the students really understood that they could turn it in late, they could earn the points, or at least some of the points, 
um, but they might not get um, as comprehensive uh, feedback as if they had uh, turned it in, in time. Um, and I think in general, what I'm trying to do with a lot of this material is move from uh, really what uh, how I was taught, which is kind of a, a shame-based model of teaching in which, uh, you know, making a mistake in which uh, missing a deadline is equal to punishment, e.g. they lose points. So sometimes I don't even um, mark off for a wrong answer. And um, this is one of the benefits of um, working in the humanities is there are better answers in my classes and worse answers, but you know, it's, you know, black and white wrong answers are not necessarily uh, what, what I'm striving for. Um, so instead we might workshop an answer uh, and talk about why uh, this answer may have mixed the mark a little bit and um, what might be a, a better answer. And to try and create an environment which students feel like they can explore the topic rather than having to get it right the first time uh, and be uh, punished uh, for making a mistake. So, so that's sort of very generally what I've been experimenting with. Now, in terms of uh, results, uh, particularly for exams, because I know that's um, a, a lot of what uh, we as uh, instructors focus on, um, I'm just giving you the results here from two classes that I taught in uh, fall of 2021. On the left is my introduction to folklore class, and on the right is my children's folklore. This was, uh, for both classes, an exam where there was no time limit. Um, the average, according to Canvas statistics, uh, for taking the uh, 2210 exam was two hours, and you can see that the average score was 89%. So it was not an A plus because they were Googling answers and had the answers at their fingertips. It was still, you know, it was a good grade. It was a B plus, um, but it wasn't 100%. Um, What's interesting to me about this about these uh, results, however, is the right hand side of the screen, which is the children's folklore class. Now, in this class, they took much longer. The average time for the exam was four hours, and you can see that the average score was actually lower at eighty five percent. So, the fact that the students had the exam open for longer did not equate to necessarily a better grade. And this sort of just reinforces uh, my own take on a limitless uh, time for exams that students will put as much work as they want into the exam and as much work as they can, and then they just turn it in. And the open book, open notes, they have all those resources. And of course, the better students are going to um, already be familiar with those resources, know where to go to get the answers that they need to, or maybe they may have the answers at their fingertips. And the poorer students are still going to uh, struggle a little bit. They will have those resources there, but they may not be um, as adept uh, at them. And certainly in neither case, uh, did this open book, open note, no time limit exam result in, you know, everybody acing the test in, in any kind of way. Okay, from other uh, assignments, um, I would say now I know one of the fears, and this is certainly a fear I had when I started experimenting with this, uh, is that you would, you know, I would be inundated with late assignments and things would be coming in at all different kinds of times. And um, that really actually has not happened all that much. Uh, I do give a deadline um, and most students generally turn it in at the preferred deadline. I think students like having deadline. They like having that uh, structure. So I would say 80 to it, probably a little higher, maybe 85 to 90% of the students actually turned the assignment in at the preferred deadline. And then I had uh, some stragglers for every assignment, but I wasn't really inundated with, you know, tons and tons of, of late work. Uh, and I also uh, reserved the right to, if, if a student turned in something late, you know, I didn't feel obliged to get it back immediately to them within a week or so. I just kind of did it on my own time and, and that was made very clear in the class. And I feel like in some ways I actually saved some time because I wasn't hunting down those errant students who were, um, as I had in previous semesters saying, hey, you know, turn that in, turn that in, turn that in. They just knew they had to get it in at some point or they weren't gonna get any points uh, at all. And this was, you know, kind of uh, surprising to me 
because I really did, you know, when I first did this, I was really nervous and I was like, oh God, this is going to suck. And, and it didn't, it didn't. So I was um, pleasantly surprised. Okay. Now in terms of organizing the semester, um, one of the things that I do, and this is part of the sort of movement towards, uh, I think, more flexibility in terms of how the, the semester is organized, is that I have moved from early in my teaching where I just gave a couple of exams and maybe a big paper uh, at, the, at the end, which is how I was taught, to uh, many more very low stakes assignments. So uh, for example, I have weekly writing assignments or weekly quizzes, depending on the uh, the class. Sometimes I have kind of a combination of both, but uh, students are expected to turn uh, something in every week. Um, they also usually have multiple discussion posts, one to two, I would say, if it's a, you know on Canvas, or sometimes uh, like some finding assignments. We work a lot with the archives, so I might have them go to the archives, find something in the archives, either physically or online, and come back and share it with a class. These are graded uh, because, again, uh, when I didn't grade these assignments and just felt like they, you know, sort of were assignments that would engage them in the material, I got some complaints about um, the, the, the exercises as being perceived as unimportant. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, formal exams uh, or a final research paper uh, that has flexible, you know, due dates, but flexible due dates uh, for, for scaffolding purposes. So, uh, in answer to your question, yes, I am always grading. So I always have a, a stack of papers uh, to grade. I get these weekly uh, low stakes writing assignments or quizzes, you know, those come in at the end of the week, usually uh, Canvas on Sunday, and I get those back by Tuesday or Wednesday. So it's just kind of a constant flow for me over the course of the semester. But the important thing to remember is that these are low stakes assignments. So I don't have to spend, you know, an inordinate amount of time on each assignment. I have a rubric. Um, if it's a, a quiz, I have a key. So um, there might be, you know, one question that I have to hand grade because it might be a short essay or something like that. But these go pretty quickly. And I have not felt like it's overwhelming because, again, they're they're pretty low stakes. Um, OK, what else do I want to say? Let's move on to student uh, responses. Um, now, the student responses for both classes uh, were pretty positive. What I've pulled out here is from the uh, qualitative portion of the idea of student evaluations, and I pulled out only the uh, responses that had to do with the grading uh, uh, specifically. So the left one, I believe this was from my introduction to folklore class. She was the most understanding and fair professor who's taught me thus far. So I thought that was a pretty um, positive evaluation. Um, and by understanding and fair, I don't feel like I was grading necessarily any differently than I had done in previous semesters. I just had that kind of flexibility built into the semester. Um, here's the one, the critique I got, which I think is fair. Having homework that wasn't being graded was a little hard to be motivated to do. Uh, and I've had that comment uh, in various forms a different, a couple of different times when I've done ungraded assignments. So I have now gotten rid of ungraded assignments. And then over on the right-hand side, Dr. G was very fair with grading and it was so nice to have unlimited time for the exams. I felt like I didn't have time to, I, I felt like I did, I felt that I didn't have to rush and I could take my time formulating what I'd studied into a response. So to me, that really summarizes, you know, what my real goal is as a teacher, which is not to train them to take a test in a particular amount of time, but really to think about what is, what is it that they want to say, how can they connect with the material, and to give them the time and the resources to kind of brainstorm and formulate um, the response within an exam format. So I was uh, pretty uh, happy with that. I would also say that um, in a class I taught this past spring, I had a Scott's peer review uh, done. Um, this was in a different class. And in according to the Scott's peer reviewer, when he asked the question, and I was doing similar things in this, in this class this spring, does this uh, 
class worked for my learning style, 100% of the students said yes. 100%. So I never get 100% on anything. So I was pretty um, surprised again by and happy, you know, by 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 that student response. So what are my conclusions? Um, or what are what are my ideas? Um, my ideas are that number one, you know, students who are really good students and are motivated students are going to do well, no matter what. Um, they can take any kind of class, they can adopt to the uh, learning style that the professor or the instructor uh, uses, and they will do well because they're good students. But students who are struggling or who are not naturally inclined uh, in school, um, this helps these uh, students. So for example, um, in these classes, no one flunked. You know, and for me, that was great. I always have one or two students who who try and do the work um, and who end up flunking anyway. Th there were I, I, I'll qualify that just a little bit. Uh, there were uh, one or two students who flunked, but that was because they never came. So that was a, a different category of, of student. Um, there were still a few D's. Um, but the students really had every uh, opportunity to succeed that I could have possibly given them. Um, and in those cases, they really just couldn't complete the work. Um, and so they received Ds. And I really felt like that they earned those Ds. And um, I wasn't um, uh, torn up about it or, or anything like that. And so what I really concluded was that increased flexibility, particularly in um, the terms of deadlines and these test limits, really meant that poor students or struggling students had more opportunities uh, to succeed. And when I was um, Googling kind of an image just for the slide, I came across this book um, that I was not familiar with um, by uh, Elise Debye and Kate Brown called Forward with Flexibility, a teaching and learning, learning resource for accessibility and inclusion. And um, they articulated essentially what I was coming, uh, what I've been coming to a, a little bit more inductive, inductively. I don't do, uh, you know, education research, um, which is that increased flexibility simply means increased accessibility and increased inclusion for those struggling students, and then therefore leads to increased student success. And certainly, I feel like I've seen that um, a little, you know, to some to some degree uh, in my classes. Um, okay, now the questions and issues that I've had, and these are just my, my own struggles, is, uh, you know, number one, is this a lessening rigor? I've really had to ask myself this question because, you know, I'm a type A personality. I like things done. I like lists. I like to check them off. But of course, this is probably why I went into academia uh, in, the in the first place, you know, and, and am I doing students a disservice? by giving them this, this kind of flexibility. Um, and honestly, you know, I, I don't have an answer for that. I suspect that if I asked you uh, as the audience, you guys would have a, a wide uh, range of opinions, but this is the way I'm gonna go for a while and just see uh, how I feel about it. It feels good to me to have more students succeed in the course and be able to pass the course. And it feels good to me to have those positive comments that sort of reinforce this idea of flexibility. And it feels good to know that it, it seems to be that this notion of flexibility has a little bit of traction in uh, education research as well. Um, the other thing though that I also um, struggle with or, or, or I'm trying to think a little bit critically about is you know, what is my how does my own privilege and my own position within the university play into this? In other words, how does my own privilege allow me to do something like this? Um, and, you know, for me, this works because of the kinds of materials I teach. Um, you know, I am not in the hard sciences. And so um, there are not, as I mentioned, usually 100% 100% wrong, right? And 100% wrong uh, answers. Uh, you know, my own student population, particularly at the undergraduate level, is gen ed. So these are not students who um, are in a major. Uh, I'm just trying to get them to think a little bit about culture, to learn about culture uh, in, in a critical way. 
uh, and to get them to think critically and uh, read some text and put their thoughts into, into writing. Uh, I also have small classes, uh, and I realize that this can really impact uh, this teaching practice as well. My classes are capped at uh, between 30 and 35 students, and I teach two, two uh, classes a semester. So I have a relatively small student population. So I don't really know how uh, this would work for somebody, for example, who teaches really large classes. You know, if uh, people have TAs, it might be possible to do this, you know, with, with TAs. But I would certainly encourage you to, you know, think about it and um, see how you might at least implement pieces of it as an experiment in one of your classes and, and see what happens. You know, pay you know, attention to the number of students who you know, pass with a little higher grade, students who may have dropped out otherwise, actually stay in the class and maybe don't do great, but at least you know, get a D or a C minus um, versus how many students you know, normally flunk because it, it really has helped me and those numbers. And I honestly, again, in my heart feel like it, particularly uh, going back to those uh, conversations I had with my students, which is some students just have so much on their plate. Um, it's really, really overwhelming. And I know for me, I always have a lot on my plate and I always appreciate uh, flexibility in getting my work done and I get my work done. Um, but it's nice to be able to do what I need to do when I need to do it. And I feel like this help gives offers that same opportunity for students. So, okay, that's it for my presentation. Thanks again for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, I would love to hear from you. So please reach out to me. Again, my name is Lisa Gabbert and that's my email there, lisa.gabbert at usu.edu. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop sharing my screen and say thank you for coming.